Good morning, Governor. Thank you for taking the time to join us. Oh, great to be with you. Thank you. Uh, now, you got big news this week. Uh, a judge in Pennsylvania has placed your name on the ballot there in Pennsylvania, which means you're going to be on 48 states. That's got to feel pretty good. Yeah, well, we're on 48. We're still litigated in the other two. And uh, at a minimum uh, in Michigan, I will uh, be qualified as a write-in candidate. So 49 states, Oklahoma to go. <laughs> now, I know, obviously, you're also trying to get yourself into the debates. I know that you missed the, the first presidential debate. Are you in court? Are you trying to litigate this issue? And where does that stand? Yeah, we are trying to litigate this issue. And, uh, and of course, the, the fact that we're, uh, that we're in court, and we'll have to stay tuned and see what that uh, produces. But Presidential Debate Commission, uh, made up of Republicans and Democrats, and uh, they have no interest in seeing a third party on stage. Let's start there. Let's give us give us a sense for what is the difference that you would bring, not just to the debate, but to the country from your viewpoint, from your vantage point. What's the major difference between yourself and the Republican and Democratic parties? Um, I don't want to bomb Iran. Uh, I want to get out of Afghanistan now, bring the troops home. I believe that marriage equality is a constitutionally guaranteed right. I want to end the drug wars. Let's legalize marijuana now. I would like to repeal the Patriot Act. I would have never signed it in the first place. I would have never signed the National Defense Authorization Act, allowing for you and I as U.S. citizens to be arrested and detained without being charged. I think that's why we fought wars. I think we need to balance the federal budget now. Uh, and that means a $1.4 trillion reduction in federal spending. And to do that, you've got to start off by talking about Medicaid, Medicare, uh, military spending. Uh, I'm the only candidate that wants to uh, eliminate corporate tax, uh, income tax, abolish the IRS, and replace all of that with one federal consumption tax. Uh, I'm embracing the fair tax, which I think is really the answer when it comes to American jobs, because in a zero corporate tax rate environment, if the private sector doesn't create tens of millions of jobs, then it just isn't going to happen. I want to get into some of the specifics with you in terms of what you want to do away with and where that would leave us. But let's look at the reverse side. What is your philosophy for government? What should government be doing? You've given us a lot of examples of what it shouldn't be doing. In your mindset, what should the federal government be there to do? Well, it should be there to provide a level playing field, that we all have a level playing field to uh, the American dream. Uh, in that context, government should protect us against individuals, groups, uh, corporations, foreign countries that would do us harm. That's government's primary responsibility. Now, you talked about, I know on your website, you talked about how government-run health care simply won't work. I got to tell you, there's a lot of senior citizens and veterans who like what they get from their Medicare and like what they get from the VA. What makes you think that government-run health care does not work? <laughs> well, why shouldn't, why shouldn't we all not like a benefit that we're paying $30 for and getting $100 benefit? And I'm talking about Medicare now, where we might pay in $30,000 and get a $100,000 benefit. Look, what's not to like about that? Well, what's not to like about it is that it is not sustainable and that if we don't cut Medicare, uh, we're going to find ourselves with no health care at all. If we don't balance the federal budget, uh, I'm in the camp that believes that uh, we come to a monetary collapse as a result of borrowing and printing money to the tune of 43 cents out of every dollar that we spend. And a monetary collapse, very simply, is when the dollars we have in our pocket don't buy a thing because of the accompanying inflation that is going to go along with what we're doing. So what would you do to Medicare? Well, in New Mexico, I oversaw the reform of Medicaid, health care to the poor. Uh, we took it from a fee-for-service model to a managed care model. We saved hundreds of millions of dollars, and we delivered better health care. At the time, I believe if the federal government would have block-granted the state of New Mexico 43% less money, done away with all the strings and the mandates associated with uh, the delivery of health care to the poor, that I could have effectively overseen the health care de delivery to the poor. Now, that would have meant drawing new lines. Who is really, who are those really in need? But I think I could have done it. I believe that in my heart. I would apply that same template to Medicare, uh, health care for those over 65. The federal government needs to get out of the health care delivery business completely, give it up to the states, uh, 50 laboratories of innovation and best practice, and I think that's exactly what we will have. We'll have some fabulous success that'll get emulated. 
We'll also have some terrible failure. That'll get avoided. But uh, if we've got 50 states working on this, that's how we're going to work our way out of this, as opposed to Washington top down knows best. Uh, that has us in our current state of uh, bankruptcy. But, Governor, what happens if you're a senior who lives in one of those 50 laboratories that you talk about that ends up failing? I mean, these are real human lives we're talking about, people who are counting on this money, keep counting on this health care. How can you just sort of play with their lives that way? Well, by play with your play with their lives, what what is go going unspoken here is if we don't balance the federal budget, we find ourselves in a monetary collapse. Monetary collapse is a situation where there are no government services at all. So what's not being discussed here is the alternative of no health care whatsoever for those in need. If you were to give an estimate, could you give me an estimate as to the number of people, the percentage of people currently receiving Medicare that won't be receiving Medicare if you were elected? You know, I don't, I don't think it'll be a matter of uh, receiving it or not receiving it, uh, although I think means testing should be a part of it. Uh, I'm just suggesting that we have to cut the expenses of Medicare by 43 percent. We need to cut government spending by 43 percent or we find ourselves in, uh, in an awful situation. Uh, Russia experienced a monetary collapse at the end of the 80s. The ruble went from being worth something one day to being worth nothing the next day. Look, the shelves are bare. Everybody figures out money doesn't buy anything, so you rush, rush to the store to buy everything that you can before the shelves go bare. That's what happens in a monetary collapse, and we are not immune from the mathematics of continuing to borrow and spend money to the tune of borrow and print money to the tune of 43 cents out of every dollar we spend. You said before, let's turn to the wars. We'll get to the war on drugs in a second, but let's talk about the wars that we're in between Iraq and Afghanistan. And you also said not to bomb. You would not be bombing Iran. Does the U.S. have any duty or responsibility when it comes to defending and helping uh, Israel? Well, defending is one thing, but, um, you know, the, the whole notion of military spending. Uh, look, um, Defense is the operative word here. We should be providing ourselves with a strong national defense, but not offense and not nation building. If I were president of the United States, I would be lobbying Israel right now to not bomb Iran. We bomb Iran, we're going to find ourselves with another hundred million enemies to this country that we wouldn't otherwise have. And I am talking about our military interventions that have resulted in hundreds of millions of enemies to this country that but for our military interventions would probably not exist. And what is Iran other than an unintended consequence of taking out Iraq and Saddam Hussein? That's why they're raising their head right now. Was Afghanistan, was the invasion of Afghanistan in 2001-2002, uh, was that a mistake? No, that was not a mistake. I completely supported that. But uh, I am arguing that after being in Afghanistan for six months, we wiped out al-Qaeda. You know what? That was uh, 10, 11 years ago. We should have gotten out of Afghanistan 10, 11 years ago. Now, if you go back to Iraq in 2003, I was opposed to that. Um, I did not think there were weapons of mass destruction. And if there were, we have the military surveillance capability to see that happening. And we have all sorts of options. But if we invade Iraq, and this was back in 2003, I thought we were going to find ourselves in a civil war uh, to which there would be no end. I think the corollaries to uh, Iran are very, very similar. Does Iran have a nuclear weapon? Well, th there's some conjecture over that. But you know what? We can watch this. We have options available. But uh, pulling the trigger first? Look, um, the, the largest demonstration in the world in support of the United States after 9-11 was in Iran. More than a million citizens in Iran uh, came out in support of the United States, and we're going to bomb the citizens of Iran. This makes a lot of sense to me. The trade embargo right now with Iran, they're running at 70% inflation. Do they hate their government because of the inflation? No, they hate the United States because we're behind the trade embargo. What about the trade embargo with Cuba? Would you maintain the trade embargo with Cuba? No, I would not. Well, here's the issue with Cuba, all right, is if, if you lift the trade embargo, which I'm all for free trade, all right, with Cuba, but what, what you end up doing is you end up putting money in the hands of uh, the dictatorship, not, uh, not the people. And that's the issue with Cuba. But yes, we should be opening up trade with Cuba, travel to Cuba. Uh, the war on drugs, the other war you talked about, you say you want to end it. Talk to me about that. Why do you want to end the war on drugs and what would the result be? Well, the result would be is, uh, is a safer uh, nation. Uh, we, we have 2.3 million people behind bars in this country. The majority category of those behind bars 
are there on drug-related crimes, selling drugs. I think that 90% of the drug problem is prohibition-related, not use-related. That's not to discount the problems with use and abuse, but that should be the focus. So I think we're at a tipping point on this issue. I think we're going to legalize marijuana. It's on the ballot in Colorado this fall to regulate marijuana like alcohol. I think it's going to pass. Uh, citizens of Denver six years ago voted to decriminalize marijuana on a campaign based on marijuana being safer than alcohol. What's happened in the last six years in Denver? Well, the sky hasn't fallen. Police are actually out enforcing real crime as opposed to nonviolent, victimless drug crime. We have tens of millions of Americans now who are convicted felons that but for our drug laws would otherwise be tax-paying, law-abiding citizens. Now, Governor, you've really angered folks from the Republican Party, your, your campaign here. They feel that, that you're going to undermine Mitt Romney's efforts to become president. How do you respond to that? Well, it's been put to the test in five states. They've actually polled the numbers in five states. In three states, uh, New Mexico, Colorado, and Nevada now, as of like yesterday, I take more votes away from Obama. In North Carolina, in Michigan, I take more votes away from Romney. Uh, look, a wasted vote is voting for somebody that you don't believe in. Vote for somebody you believe in. That's how you change this country. And I'm making a pitch to everybody to waste their vote on me. And if everybody will do that, I'm the next president of the United States. And I'm going to promise you that I will doggedly pursue everything I'm talking about. I find it remarkable that Obama and Romney are on stage arguing who's going to spend more money on Medicare when we all recognize that this has to be mutual sacrifice on the part of all of us if we're going to survive this, and yet there's this somehow distant belief that Santa Claus, the Easter Bunny, by extension the Tooth Fairy, they're going to all come to the rescue? I don't think so. It's us, but we got to take control of this, and we're not. Both parties have their heads in the sand over all these really, really important issues. What's a win for you on November 6th? Well, a win is every single day I wake up and I'm able to provide a voice to what is not being given a voice. And that is all the issues that we face and the solutions that go along with the issues that we face. And more than anything, I'd like people to tune in to Gary Johnson 2012 and realize that uh, here is somebody who actually uh, is going to go out and doggedly pursue what he's talking about, that he has a resume and that it actually is very successful and it has to do with smaller government, spending less money, and keeping government out of the bedroom, keeping government out of making decisions for you and I that only you and I should be making. Governor Gary Johnson, thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much for having me on.